So I'm going to go ahead and get started by letting all these amazing people introduce themselves. Ah, okay. Um, I am BC Wolf. I'm a musician, uh, an innovator, and um, I will... Oh, so I, <laughs> I just created a, uh, a series of World First Designs for my albums over the years, which will be um, exhibited at the Victorian Albert Museum in September. Yay. <laughs> and who's the last person that was invited to do that? Oh. So the, the, the only other time they've done this for a musician um, was with David Bowie, so very honoured. In good company. Um, hi, I'm Kim Adams, and uh, I come from a traditional film background. I was down here living in L.A. for about 20 years. I was uh, assistant editor for a long time, and then also in visual effects, and then moved into production, um, and then moved up to the Bay Area to work at Pixar. Um, I produced short form content at Pixar for about five years and then transitioned into VR, um, working at Google Spotlight Stories. Uh, produced two short films for them and then uh, transitioned to the head of production at Oculus Story Studio until they closed the studio last May. And uh, now I'm currently working consulting in um, some high tech companies in AR and innovation projects. Hi, I'm Kayla Tabish, um, independent filmmaker. Started out in the feature world with independence, which is uh, generally begging and borrowing, and sort of um, escalated that up into from micro budget into low budget. Um, and then this fall, shooting our fourth feature, uh, nominated for an IFP Gotham Award. Kind of had the uh, ability to kind of evolve into encompassing everything within our production company. So we're from conception all the way to distribution, and then we hand it off to a third party for aggregation and the distribution process itself. Um, but from conception, we're bringing in the private equity all the way through development, packaging, in-house talent, into uh, pre-production, locations, whatnot, blocking, um, shot listing, and then all the way through. Um, I produced the four features and uh, was lucky enough to direct the last one. So um, just that's a bit of my progression. I like how you say lucky enough. I'd like to say good enough to direct the last one. <laughs> well, very much with uh, independent film, it's getting the people behind you that will believe because your financing generally with independent film isn't coming from institution um, unless you're in those higher budget ranges beyond the three million. So having at least enough like producing behind me and then developing those skills. So, yeah. <laughs> So get today there. we're going to be diving into the experiences that you'll have when it comes to VR, AR, and MR, which are still to this day very hot topics. I feel that I can send out an email and it will say VR in it and I will automatically get a response back. Mm -hmm. It's still something that, although it's been a difficult few years, um, everyone is really embracing and we're all figuring out how to drive this new aspect of the industry forward. So something that I want to start out asking you all is, what was the first VR, AR, or MR experience to really spark your interest in this emerging field? So I'm a little less um, caught off guard this time. Um, so I'm going to give you a slightly different answer, which is that I think um, I started thinking about you know, mixed reality in a different way from the time I discovered um, music, which was, you know, started writing songs when I was about seven or eight. And I, at the same time, found my parents' record collection. Um, and I just thought records were the most magical things. You know, you could open them up like musical books and read them like a story. And you had the artwork, you had the liner notes, you had this sense of ceremony, this feeling of a story. Um, and from that, you know, from that point, I was imagining what my album would feel like and what it would look like, kind of as much as what it would sound like. And that idea of being able to enter into a world with a record was something that from you know, age eight, I was kind of imagining like what worlds could I create for my albums? So you know, over the years, I've approached this in a number of different ways from 3D vinyls for the phone you know, back in 2012, um, to musical jackets made out of fabric woven with my music, 
um, by Bowie and Hendrix's Taylor. Um, and then, you know, it was this, this case of, you know, those albums were really responses to the digital download era. And suddenly we've moved into streaming. And I was thinking, well, what would the anti-stream for today look like? What is the opposite of our current experience? What are we missing? We've got this very sonically and creatively compressed experience, and there's nothing wrong with that for many reasons, but what would the antithesis of this look like? And I started thinking about the artwork and the liner notes and all of that rich content, and at the time of thinking about this anti-stream, I happened to be on site at Bell Labs in the quietest room in the world, which is their anechoic chamber. And this room made such an impression on me and sort of feeling what it was like to be in real silence, but also hearing music in that environment. I came up with this idea to stage this physical stream uh, from the Bell Labs anechoic chamber, which we would stream in Live 360, which at that, at, at that point it had only just been done. But then as the record was playing and people were able to log into this sacred space, uh, and feel what it was like to be in that room and hear in that ceremonial way using live augmented reality. Uh, the lyrics would be streaming out of the vinyl, the artwork would be surrounding you, and suddenly that chamber would be transforming into the visual landscape of each particular track. And that had never been done before, so it was only down to Eric Schmidt seeing a description of this vision that I'd sent Bell Labs and thinking it was just super cool that he said we, we had to be able to host it on on YouTube, so they ended up sort of assigning us all this bandwidth um, and you know d doing a sort of special case scenario for it. So it was the world's first live 360 AR stream, and so AR and VR was a huge component of my last release. I mean, it was pretty much predominantly that, but it was the why. Why I was doing it was because it recreated the feeling of sitting there as an eight-year-old holding a vinyl and having all the artwork come to life in my head, in my mind, and have this sense of ceremony for that listening experience. Oh my God, how do you follow that? <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> this is why I work and uh, do what I do, because I get to meet people inspiring like BT. Um, so I uh, was really inspired. I had you know, been in traditional filmmaking and visual effects, very clear, concise pipelines, tried and true. Um, and I wanted something different. I wasn't sure what it was, but I started working at uh, Google ATAP, which is the Advanced uh, Technology and Projects Group, um, where they have scientists and artists just sort of brainstorming. I started working on a project there. It was a really, uh, I can't talk about it, I guess, because it was still top secret. Uh, but it had to do with storytelling and artistry. Um, and there I became really close with the Google Spotlight Stories team and they were just finishing up a project called Duet that Glenn, Glenn Keane had directed. Mm -hmm. And Glenn is a legendary uh, animator from Disney and I don't know, has anyone seen Duet, a Spotlight Story? Yeah. Um, it's hand drawn, 10,000 hand drawings come to life uh, around you. You should download, download the Google Spotlight Stories app and, and you can basically see Glenn's drawings come to life around you. It's, um, you know, two babies that grow up, a boy and a girl, and you can look this way and follow the girl's life and, and look that way and follow the boy, and at certain points they join together, and it's this really beautiful, lyrical, emotional um, journey that you go on with them. And I, I was so shocked that my phone became a, a window into their story and their world. Um, that I just, I, I didn't understand it, um, and I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew that I wanted to learn more about it, um, and so quickly convinced that team to hire me <laughs> to come and work for them, and then worked really closely with their engineers, um, and fell in love with their team. So I, I just was really inspired that here was something in VR, um, you know, that wasn't a 360 cat video. It was a story that could really keep you emotionally engaged and immerse you in a world in a very different way. Um, and equally inspired by the experience that the, the team had working with Glenn um, and meeting Glenn and talking to him and talking to the engineers about what their experience was like. Um, you know, Glenn really was embedded in the engineering team and he was in the little tiny room with them with whiteboards and he would be drawing in the corner on his drawing pad and they would look over his shoulder and then he would come over and they would do you know, zeros and ones on the whiteboard and he would go, God, what? <laughs> How many frames? What do you mean? And then he would draw something and say, could you do this? And they were like, hmm, 
no, but what about this? And the, it was just this ongoing dialogue um, where they were inspiring each other and sort of pushing each other forward that was so magical to me and um, because there's so many unknowns involved and so many smart creative people so I wanted more of that experience where there were less knowns and there was more mystery and more to be discovered and so duet really inspired me in that way. I do want to just take a second and dive a little deeper into something that you just said before we move on. So with the traditional background that you came from and the established pipeline and speaking to how much you wanted more of those unknowns, which we all know there are a lot of unknowns right now in our particular sector of the industry, did you at any point in your career as of late face any opposition or is any hesitation to embrace aspects of this new technology? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean the default is sort of like, I don't get, I don't get it. I don't get this whole VR thing. I don't get it. Um, so people, you know, and I think a lack of vision on every level, even at the top levels of, of companies, uh, can be really disheartening. Um, but you know, good producers, they, they um, persevere and they believe and things that are invisible until they become visible. And so you hold that vision and you keep going because you know um, what's in front of you, which is a, a path to you know, a really um, robust uh, marketplace of incredible content and experiences. It's out there, it's just getting from here to there. It's the journey is what it's about right now and we're in this place of journey and discovery, which is actually why um, it's really incredibly cool to be in right now. Like the same reasons it's incredibly frustrating and hard um, because the tech is breaking, there's not a lot of people who have a lot of experience in it, um, there's, there's no way to schedule and budget, you know, with any real knowing that you're going to get it right. Um, there's so many problems and so many hardships, but those are the same things that make it really exciting to be a part of. So the experience that really sort of stuck me in and caught my eye was definitely less artistic than both of those, but what I found was that um, there was a segue for VR and AR and MR to actually be an advertising campaign, and I found mm -hmm. that with um, um, uh, the Smash Room that Suicide Squad did, and they took that footprint and they would put that at various festivals like Toronto and um, also at their premiere, and so what it would allow in a very primal level, not very much story, but um, the patron can come in and sort of smash up the room and debris falls. The debris is computer generated, um, the actual boxes that they can lift up, which was a couple years back. So this was really the first experience where we were using um, VR to advertise and figuring out what companion pieces will actually help to bring a call to action for the viewer. Because oftentimes um, people are interpreting VR as a mode of storytelling, which I do believe we're in the pioneering stages, but as far as it being immensely successful, we're not quite there yet, but finding ways to utilize it for marketing campaigns as well. So that was the one that kind of pushed me into exploring other avenues to have these companions uh, along with our projects and our releases. I really like that I'm hearing you speak about the mode of storytelling and whether or not it will be successful because that begs the question of what are the best uses of VR, AR, and MR? And I say that in asking from a personal experience, which the majority of my background is working in VR. So I started working in VR about four years ago at the virtual reality company when they first put out the Martian VR experience. And for four years, my mind has completely be, been emerged in that world, that these are the tools that I now tell stories. Last August, I went home and I shot a 360 documentary about the last abortion clinic in Kentucky and how it was trying to be closed. Um, I came back and I reviewed my footage and I found myself longing that I had shot this traditionally that I hadn't actually thought through the process of how I was going to tell that story and how the footage was going to look. And so we were just speaking earlier about how we have multiple tools, multiple ways to tell stories. So what are your approaches to choosing how you're going to tell a story? And what do you think the best cases, the best use of VR, AR, MR is? You want to go first? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, it's just sort of basically adding on to what I had said before. For us on the independent level, it's finding ways that it can be cost effective. So if you're Suicide Squad, for example, as I used before, they have like a huge print and advertising budget so they can utilize that in lieu of like billboards and buses, which I think that if the call to action can translate to ticket sales, then it can be effective. But for me personally, with the independent realm, it's finding ways that it can be cost effective, which can be a little bit more difficult. We're still yet to utilize a campaign um, in tandem with a release of a film, but I would very much, we are currently exploring that and looking at ways that we can, um, for example, our next feature is a political thriller. So we've been sort of coming up with ideas of uh, political like mini campaigns that can encompass things that sort of the youth and I mean all voters and all spectrums but the youth are very passionate about all of these hot point issues and creating sort of an experience but then within that immersive VR experience would be small Easter eggs that would sort of lap back to the film itself that would also um, support it in ways of advertising so we could allocate that from that budget. It's just um, so uncharted that it's really hard without any sort of evidence, and I'm sure you deal with this a lot, improving um, how it can be effective with the short form content that you do, uh, is proving that this can actually translate to ticket sales or to digital downloads, and that it's not just gonna be maybe a buzzworthy, noteworthy piece for the premiere, something that is cost effective to have it, I, I don't know, be it festivals or um, theaters, and have it be engaging, short and cost effective. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you had two questions, one about storytelling in VR and one about best use for, yeah. So, I mean, I'm really inspired by um, n not necessarily the entertainment uses for VR, mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, I know somebody in Boston who has a nonprofit who, who creates um, uh, bespoke content for kids and elders in palliative care who are never going to leave their their center, the center for care, who you know never made it to the Great Wall of China, or just would like to be home in their backyard playing with their dog. So he will either get stock footage or go to their house at Christmas time and film their relatives opening presents. Or you know he will he will bring those experiences to people who maybe want to check something off their bucket list. I mean to me that's incredible, and that's really making a difference in people's lives. That's really moving. Um, so I, I love hearing about that. I love just there's another company that does. Um, jazz clubs for the elderly, you know, so they're in their nursing home and they go into their headset and they're sitting, you know, stage side at the most incredible jazz performance, you know, and um, things like that um, really make me smile. Um, and as far as storytelling, I think we were talking about this, there, there needs to be a reason why you're telling this story in VR. Um, there needs to be, um, it, it needs to be something that you couldn't do otherwise. So for instance, Eliza McNitt, um, recently um, came out with this project she did called Spheres, where you get, I only saw the first part that released at Sundance, I think another, the second part was released in, in Cannes, but you are in, you get basically are in the, floating around the universe, and you get pulled into a black hole, and that black hole merges with another black hole, and you're just, you feel so tiny in the middle of this huge universe, and it's sort of like, yes, this is, this is what this medium can do, that we can't, we can't be fully immersed in any any film experience in the same way, you know. Um, something you need to experience all around you, or something that adds to the, adds to the experience. Because honestly, it's just it's too hard to do it otherwise. If there's another way to do it that's more traditional, that you can not run into so many uh, blockers, then you should do it that way. Um, but if it absolutely has to be done in this medium, that's when you know, like, okay, this is something interesting. Right, I feel that we ran into that a lot at the very beginning of the resurgence of VR. A lot of brands, which I love a really good piece of branded content, but you had a lot of people that wanted to dip their toes in and just wanted that VR or 360 experience just to have it, but there wasn't always a driving force behind it. And so I think we're starting to see the artistry shift as we've learned more of the creative language and the uses. And BD, that's what I really wanted you to speak to as someone who, I mean, you are an immersive artist, creator from 
even before you shifted into playing in this world, and it seems to come very natural to you. So how do you make the decision what to incorporate into your creations? I think um, often it really, it really is as simple as why, and I know that word gets used so many times. Sometimes I feel like it can't be used enough. Um, you know, for me, two things. The magic of music, you know, music is a magical thing that um, everything I do points back to. So every presentation of each album experience in trying to sort of recreate a vinyl for the 21st century uh, that has that artwork, that ceremony, that story, it's all just reminding people that music is, is magical. And, you know, going off on a slightly different tangent, like I, I seen this firsthand um, doing a research project looking at how music can help people with dementia which was inspired by neurologist Oliver Sacks and then ran um, you know this was a number of years ago but ended up getting picked up by Stanford and the American Alzheimer's Association um, and a couple of months ago was read out in the House of Lords as part of an initiative to get music in all care homes in the UK by 2020 when you see people you know, literally coming back from the most extreme neurological conditions, and this isn't just dementia, this is Parkinson's and autism and schizophrenia, and you see the power of music on that level to bring people back to themselves, to be able to restore and heal and move in ways that, you know, sometimes nothing else can. Um, you have such a, a respect and a love for it and you know, really everything I'm doing on the tech and innovation side is, is just ultimately recreating that feeling of magic and that feeling of like just connecting with music that I had you know, from that very early age. Um, and that's kind of informed everything. So I think you know, on, on that question of why, um, it's so vital because when you have that why, it's like it allows you, you know, to pull in these these layers, these sort of modes of presentation, because that's all it is, you know, VR, AR, MR, you know, um, holograms, like AI, whatever it is, like the, and you know, it, well, it's holograms a number of years ago, but it's these are all just ways of presenting ideas, you know, but the ideas still need to be totally solid and. You know, ultimately, I think that a lot of the, the traditional stuff, like music, like you know, books, like films, you know, all the things that remind us th that we're human and that connect us, a lot of that actually won't go out of fashion. It's just almost how we can tell those stories in new ways. So I do want to shift a little bit from this conversation of creativity and inspiration into a world that I feel if you're going to have a panel on VR, MR, AR, et cetera, that you have to at least say these words at least once or doesn't count as a panel on this emerging technology. Monetization and mass consumption. <laughs> We're going to go there. And I think it's going to be interesting to hear your answers because you each come from a very different background and you each have different strengths professionally. And honestly, I'm really interested more than a lot of other panels that I've seen to hear what you have to say on one, I'm just gonna just let's talk about monetization. So having an idea, having a reason as a storyteller is a must. And beyond that, how do we get the mass consumption and how do we monetize? <laughs> Just answer all of the questions to the world. <laughs> we'll just solve this right now. <laughs> Get your pins out. We're going to have all the answers. Um, I don't know. I'd love to say that, that uh, I don't work on projects with monetization in mind, but I don't have that luxury anymore. <laughs> There's only so many companies that can afford to really pour money into what is right now R&D. Um, you have the big companies in the world that luckily are willing to really invest in engineers and, and um creating these tools that will, you know, they're really um, creating the future. Um, and there's, there's no clear way to monetize yet, right? So we've, we had this 
time a few years ago in VR where the projections were just like crazy. You know, it was this multi, multi billion dollar business and, and uh, the realities hit and we're still doing okay, but there's no real clear path in sight. And so some of the investors are pulling away a little bit. We're seeing companies go yeah, out of business. Yeah, companies like Nitro, Oculus Story Studio Classic. get shut down. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. So, so we can't, I mean, I can't, um, you know, start my own VR company, uh, you know, that I'll do at some point um, without a clear path in mind, right? And I do feel like the, the clearest path that I see is through location-based experiences mm -hmm. um, where you have companies, larger, larger distribution companies like The Void who are, you know, going to expand and the IMAX experience centers and a ton of, you know, mom and pop VR arcades popping up around the world right now. Um, and I think that there's going to be this huge need for really good quality content. I think there's a lack of really good quality content. There's a lot of things you can, games where you can shoot at things, um, but the, um, there's not a lot of really creative, you know, VR escape rooms or, you know, smart collaborative social um, experiences that you can do together. But, and I think there's going to be a huge need for that. So I think that once you've experienced those things, though, once I go to Disneyland with my family and we all, you know, my mother-in-law, my husband, my daughter, and I do the Void, you know, Star Wars experience together, they're all hooked now. So they're in. The next time they see something like that, they're going to do it. Um, and they want to do it a couple of times. And they're going to go home to their small towns and they're going to tell all their neighbors, oh, now I get the VR thing. You guys should do that if you ever see it. It is so cool. Um, and then, you know, the Disneylands of the world start to inform people of what this new technology is. Plus, the, you know, the headsets are getting better and more affordable, and that's going to make a big difference. There's a lot of things that need to sort of line up um, to make the, the path to, to ROI uh, more clear, but I think everything is happening right now. You know, Oculus re released their new headset, and we've got another one coming, um, and I think there is a path forward. I think we just have to continue to um, be smart about production and keep teams small and overhead low uh, so that you can create content where you can actually start to make a little bit of money back. Right, it's a multi-step process yep. that starts, I think, firstly with awareness and good content. I, to be completely transparent, I didn't, I feel like I'm gonna sell myself out right now. I wasn't sure how I felt about location-based entertainment. Um, I grew up in Kentucky um, in a relatively small town and I can remember going to the mall and you would get into a simulator and you would, I don't know, be driving on Mars or something and those simulators went away after a while. But also what that did was give people in a small town or of a lower socioeconomic background or a lack of access the ability to experience something that then caused awareness and if you had a passion for it or a drive to experience more content or experiences like that, um, it was now in the forefront of your mind. And I think that that's something that really speaks to me is that awareness. And I think LBE is amazing for that awareness. Um, as an independent filmmaker, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that with any industry really that's like in its early stages, the price point is so high. That's We're going to see over time that's going to drop with the more use than consumption, more consumer nation. The more that it's consumed, the lower the price will become and the more readily available it will be. I do believe that the, and this is not my crystal ball or anything, but the first um, sort of steps will be more monetary driven um, so it'll get government will get into education there's lots of I mean it's just such a vast opportunity with VR and AR for education the medical fields advertising will be huge I think that will be something that we'll see like in our day-to-day -day life because they have the funding to come up with these sort of experiences that maybe won't necessarily require the headgear more of like the immersive experiences where um, I'm sorry, mixed reality experiences where it's sort of um, projected around you. So all of those I think will be on the forefront because they have the financial resources to be more utilized. And then the more readily available um, this new technology is, the more that it will be uh, utilized for everything from social issues to um, politics and almost every industry job training can heavily benefit from sort of an experience where you can, especially for sales, you can have sort of a like a third-party experience with yourself computer-generated. 
I was at a VR arcade conference a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying their biggest market right now is military, um, medical use for PTSD mm. treatment, and restaurant training. Like oh, big restaurant trains are, are restaurant uh, chains are training their staff strangely in VR. I'm not sure how that works, but um, you know, yeah, that architecture. Like you said, there's so many other industries investing in this um, that it's not going away. I mean, that's what gives me hope that they'll it'll it'll be around long enough that we can figure out how to how to tell stories in this medium in a really engaging way. Absolutely. Yeah, I I would say that I think these two um, brilliant people are probably better positioned because, well, to you know answer that question just from a perspective of you know, my consideration has always been artistic um, with AR and VR in this case. It was literally just how, you know, how do you make people feel like, you know, they're in this incredible um, world of the record, you know, with this artwork and, and liner notes essentially sort of coming to life around them uh, and responding to the music in real time. Um, and so, uh, but the, you know, where I see it being most interesting is exactly for the, you know, that education and awareness route, I think that is, is so key and so powerful. And even just on a level of, you know, places or, or species that are soon going to be inaccessible or n will no longer exist, you know, from, from that level of being able to, you know, just, um, kind of, yeah, access things that are soon to be, you know, not possible. Um, and, I, and I also think from the, you know, from the, the, the other perspective of just making really immersive and kind of magical content from that storytelling angle. So I, I, that's where I'm most interested. But, you know, we saw what happened with 3D TVs. They didn't really catch on. So there's like, I think we're in this very interesting time where there's kind of so much noise and we don't actually know it time will be the only thing that separates the things that stay from those that you know disappear and, and we're sort of in the eye of the storm right now i think but i do think the difference though between uh this and 3d TV, tvs is the the number of industries that are investing mm -hmm. in it right oh so, for sure yeah. yeah i was watching hulu a few nights ago and there was a commercial that came on for someone that was going around and capturing all of the historical sites that are soon to be extinct. And I just found myself having a moment of joy that I was watching Hulu and a commercial came on about AR. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know public awareness is growing. So I have kind of an, an odd question. What do you think are the stigmas that hold back mass consumption or when you're approaching a studio to bring a project to the table about this industry that you faced? There's so many. I mean, the first one, um, that people don't like to wear something on their face. Mm. It's not comfortable, it gets sweaty, it's dirty, it's like you, you look weird. Um, so that's the first thing that you need to overcome is that it just feels awkward. Um, so once you get beyond that, um, and let's say you buy your headset and you get all your free content that comes with a headset and you go through it all and there's a few things that you really like um, and you watch those and you have a friend come over and you have them try on your headset and they watch those things and then you're waiting for the new content to come in and it's really slow to come in. There's just not a lot, right? So you put the headset on the shelf and you kind of forget about it and then it gets outdated. Um, and so that's a really tricky blocker right now. Um, headsets are really expensive. Um, you need to be, ta you know, I, I need to be ta tethered with one of these things to a computer to help drive it. Um, so I can't yet walk around my living room in this space. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, that's that's really go. tricky. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's really awkward. So it's really going to help when we get the walk around headsets that are more affordable. Um, for sure, but I think those two things, like just physically, and people aren't sure how to use it. Like, and I think content-wise, we spend a lot of time bringing people into an experience 
really knowing that people um, don't know what to do once they're in it. I, it's so new to so many people. I know, and we haven't talked about this, but my friend Jackie was one of the producers on the Martian VR experience. Jackie Barnett. Yeah, and Jackie would say they had a lot of problems in the beginning because you're bringing people, they're in a, a space suit, like floating out into space, and there was this dialogue that was informational, that was expository. It was giving them information they needed to know for the experience. But So they get in the experience, and the, and the voiceover plays, and they're just like, oh, oh my God, I'm in space right now, floating around. And they would stop the experience and say, okay, so did you get all the information from the voiceover? And they'd say, what voiceover? What are you talking about? <laughs> like they just, you, there's only, it's like sensory overload. There's, there's so much you can take in. And I think, you know, 10 years from now, that won't be a problem. People will hear the audio, they'll see the visual, they'll be fine. But, but so many people are new to it that it's really, you spend a lot of time with each experience sort of onboarding the person, showing them how to look around, not giving them too much at one time and being very conscious of that. Right, I think we've all experienced that at festivals when it takes two hours to get five people through yeah. the line. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Tony or Beattie, did you have anything? Well, I think it's also very disconnecting actually. You know, I think that's a big, along with the actual you know, sort of physical um, thing on your head, which <laughs> there was at one point an idea um, to just on the music and dementia side to actually go into care homes and and potentially use, you know, headsets following on from what was just a live acoustic performance. And the immediate thing that I felt was just like, no, like, you know, having had that experience where even having a phone up can be intrusive, you know, to be putting anything on anyone that isn't in a thousand percent comfortable with it when you wouldn't know that um, is just an intrusion that I don't think you can take. And then just even on a level of like, yeah, that disconnection, you want to show something to someone, you all want to experience this, and then you're like passing the headset around, like it's, it's crazy. And I think that was a big thing that I liked about, you know, this live 360 AR stream for raw space was that actually a lot of people that were watching it, you know, they were watching it on their iPads or their computers or whatever. A lot of them didn't have headsets, but they were able to get the 360 view. They had this feeling that they were in this room. It was literally happening in real time so that, you know, if the needle skipped, the visuals would, would skip. So there was this kind of excitement of being in this installation that was sort of Warhol, John Cage-esque. And I, so I think that, you know, I just think that we, it, we need to get to a point where it can be as inclusive and sort of as immediate and as non-intrusive as possible. And, you know, that, that in some ways I think is where it has the furthest to go. I think you touched on two really important things. The, the fact that we need to make content mul for multi-format, not just for one, you mm. know, one size doesn't fit all. You need to make it for multi-format. And also, what a big impact the multiplayer experiences will be, the social VR that they're working on in places like Facebook, where they're really exploring, what do we do in a space together? How can we be in a space together and experience things? There was an experience that Chris Milk's company did um, called Life Is Us, and it's the first time I was ever with a friend in a space. Have you done it? And you're wearing the headset, friend. and you're basically, it's, it's taking you through evolution, and you've you know, start off as a tadpole and you're a dinosaur and you're running with your friend and you hear their, you know, their voice and your headset and you see them and you're like helping each other, you know, take monkeys off her back and you're screaming and it is, you know, honestly, the quality is, is not beautiful quality, but you could care less because you are having so much fun with your friend in this space, going on this journey together. And, um, you know, same thing with the other multi, uh, the void experience I did with my family. When you can do it together and you see each other as stormtroopers and you go on this adventure together, you experience it such that you think about it later as a memory, not as a movie that you all sat in a theater and watched together on a rectangle, but you, ex you it's something, a, a, a memory of something you all did together. I really, really like special. that because people, yeah. I mean, I think one of the uphill bat battles is saying that it's polarizing. Um, and I really love this idea that you might not be watching a traditional screen together, sitting hand in hand, but you have this experience where you're creating memories. And do you think that's the answer to when people ask? I mean, is social the definite answer to when people ask, is VR, AR, MR polarizing? Well, I think one of the, it, that is a solution, but I think one of the inherent problems is like, 
the fact that the masses perception of it is that it's entertainment and i think that's also why we're now labeling it experiences instead of like storytelling per se because uh, when you watch a film at home, it's such a passive experience. It's like you can really just turn off, you can veg out, so to speak, and just like kind of dive into the story that you're watching when you're watching a movie or, or, or a TV show. Um, the fact that VR is so immersive and so active, it probably, I, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but it probably uses different areas of the brain. And so if you're expecting every evening to come home and veg out to VR, you're not going to be satisfied with what you're getting. You have to look at it more of an experience, like you were saying, uh, the theme parks and um, the experiences that you're learning something new or seeing something new because it is so active and it's not going to replace and maybe the two can kind of work together it's never going to be the ability to just relax in vr i don't know there's a lot of meditation vr that's pretty amazing <laughs> <Contrary>. you know <laughs> Touché. Um, and i think that um i i actually love how personal the experience feels uh, alone in a headset in an experience you know um i think it it's really beautiful and I, and I love the multiplayer experiences where you're in there with friends experiencing things I just think it's going to run the whole whole gamut so what what some people find polarizing other people find refreshing and I just think there's a whole range there to explore I agree we don't have to experience everything together I think one of the way my dads and I connect is uh still I know it's not cool anymore but cat videos on YouTube um, my dad's 36 hours away, and yet he and I both know that we're sending each other cat videos and we're laughing, so we're not there in that moment, but there's a memory mm -hmm. and there's a connection. And so I think that to your point, how the public is perceiving VR and we're trying to box it in, uh, there are many applications and many ways to experience uh, mm -hmm. dependent upon your want. Right. Yeah. BD, did you have anything to add to experiences and... <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. I asked you if you had anything to add because I kind of forgot the yeah. initial question that we so started. We are polarizing. Um. Polarizing. <laughs> yeah, I you know I think again it just again again it just goes back to that that thing of why are you pulling people into that experience and if you're pulling them in for a good reason. Um, so even you know, I know I keep on talking about raw space, but it, it was a huge feat and it is a, a significant reference point. You know, that anechoic chamber, it was the room that Helen Keller described as the only time she'd experienced real silence. So you can imagine like this, this incredible space that had um, that profound impact on her. It was where the foil microphones were built, rogue frequencies were figured out, um, psychoacoustics were determined um, and so it was this space where over the years all these these incredible advancements you know relating to our understanding of sound and audio I mean pretty much most of the audio that we now use kind of originated from the Bell Labs anechoic chamber so even that layer of just bringing people into that room like when people put on the headset you know for raw space even before the music starts and the, the live animation come into play, people are just like, wow, this room is incredible. And that is a historic chamber. You know, that does have um, what we were talking about of sort of extinct places. Um, so again, I just think that it, you know, it can never just be, you know, some cool virtual world. Like the number of times I've, I've sort of ended up being in these like psychedelic inspired mushroom forest environments and I'm like why the hell am I in here and you know it's really dull and I think that is a huge block right now is like as you said there just isn't enough of the really great content or enough of those really educational pieces where people are actually using it for training which is where I see it being the most interesting actually. I would agree with everything each and every one of you said. And now I'm going to ask one more question before we open the floor up for you all to do a little question session. I'm going to ask a very general question that, again, is one asked on every panel, but hopefully with a little more specifics. Um, I want to ask you about predictions. And I want to ask you about predictions not in the general landscape necessarily of this technology, but specifically in the world that you're working in. So you, as an independent filmmaker, producer, 
Um, how do you see the integration of this technology as either side projects integrated with your current projects over the next five years and with what you're working on and with you as an artist? So your predictions that are specific to the sector that you're working in. It's easy, so know, easy, so right? <laughs> um, well, for the entertainment industry as a whole, I think it's going to be utilized quite a lot. But for the independent film, less and less than we would like. Um, I think that there'll be like a lot of companion pieces that are used as advertising. Um, uh, we are also taking that step into now exploiting VR experiences within the festival circuit, like with New Frontier, Sundance has, and all the top tier festivals now have a category. And coming from that also that this is sort of a women's panel, we are pushing to have 50-50 by 2020. So a lot of these voices, um, I think they're picking anywhere from 8 to 12 of these different campaign, or I shouldn't even call them campaigns. These, they are actually immersive storytelling um, that they're going to be showcasing at all of these top tier festivals. They'll get the press and exposure. And I think that that will push VR into more of a, a storytelling realm. Um, but as far as mass consumption, I don't think we're going to be quite there yet. Uh, I do see like all of the franchise, Marvel, and bigger studio productions utilizing it for advertising. Uh, it's just like deciding between what is your access point and how can it be cost effective. So if you are using it as advertising, is it the, the per person quota that you're spending, is that actually going to translate to be cost effective for ticket sales or downloads? And um, until it becomes probably less of an experience that you go to, like a novelty and more of an in-home everyday sort of usage once we bridge that gap i think you know the potential is uh, you, you can't even explain what we'll be able to do with it um you know having worked on a, a number of innovation teams recently and kind of having an eye toward the future I definitely think that it's going, within five years is such a long time right now. I mean, even three months is a long time right now, you know? Very true. I um, was talking to somebody at the AR, uh, or VR arcade conference, and he was saying, yeah, my sales, I've been here six months, my sales for these VR rigs were uh, $60,000 in the first three months and $600,000 the last three months, um, and, and lots for these other industries, but I do see um, it becoming less of a novelty and more of a norm, especially uh, I think with AR and MR leading the way because people do want to, they do feel awkward in the headsets right now. They do want to still feel like they're in their own houses, they're in their own experiences. Um, and I think that we're going to see people who want to consume media doing it more through AR experiences and people who want to have uh, more individual journeys or journeys with friends, like, hey, let's go out to dinner, and then I booked us an Arctic adventure at 8 o'clock down the street at the arcade, um, those kind of things. But it'll, that will become much more the norm. We'll see it happening, VR popping up in you know, maybe AMC theaters or um, a lot more distribution centers will be open. People will get used to it. And I think there's going to be a, a flood of really interesting content as soon as that marketplaces there with a return on investment. I mean, right now it's sort of the Wild West. Some arcades are charging by the minute, some are charging by the hour, some are doing subscription. It's kind of all over the map right now, but I think we will, we will hit our stride over the next five years. Right, and then it will become less of uh, a very expensive privilege in some aspects and something mm -hmm. more tangible. It'll be a lot more democratized for sure. Mm -hmm. I think the headset costs are going to go down and they'll become much more commonplace. Can I not make any predictions? You can, <laughs> yes, you can do whatever you would like. <laughs> Our visionary. I just like to I just like to watch this space on that one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, if you are okay, we can open the floor up for sure. questions. I mean, I don't know if we would expect them to actually say no. We're not okay with that. Um, so, does anyone have a question for our phenomenal panelist? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see AR being kind of the front line uh, solution to that because we're seeing uh, the real world with superimposed CGI on top of that. But where do you think the uh, uh, industry will be at where that latency issue isn't making people nauseous anymore? Uh, where do you think that's going to happen? Because we're still a little behind the gun on that topic. And, and even simple pattern recognition, shape recognition, and low light conditions isn't. 
I think a lot of those problems are resolved already. I don't know if you've seen stuff lately, but I... I, I have a PS4. Uh, cool. So you're watching mostly games, but not as much with the narrative experiences? Yeah, that's what. Content's not very good right now, right? Yeah, and so I think that companies like Google, who invest in Spotlight Stories, who built their own engine called Moxie, who tackled that, where they're, they're um, you know, I'm not very technical, but I know their engine is incredibly fast. Have you checked out Spotlight Stories, where you can be in a 360 environment looking uh, wherever you want? If I look away from the main action, the main action actually pauses for me as I look around the music seamlessly loops until I come back and it's adjusting to where I'm looking in real time. It's really an incredible engine. Spot, Google, Google Spotlight Stories, yeah, you can download it. Um, but it's very, very fast. And I think that the latency issues are getting much better. And I think that the, uh, the experiences where you get nauseous are just, um, I don't have any tolerance for that. There's no excuse for that anymore, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, motion is, transportation is really tricky. That's why um, the last uh, experience I worked on at Oculus Story Studio is called Wolves in the Walls, and we spent six months just trying different ways of transporting you through space so that you wouldn't get sick, right? So, but we had the resources, we, we stopped having the resources, but we had the resources uh, to spend a good six months just researching the best way to transport you thoughtfully. Um, and you can see that experience now. It premiered at Sundance. The first part of it is out. It's based on a Neil Gaiman story where you're led through the narrative experience by a little girl, an AI character. Um, and it's very, the transportation is very thoughtfully done, very conscious of not making people sick. And there's always canaries, right, in your studio. You're like, I, oh, that person's really prone to motion sickness. Come over here and try this one out. <laughs> you know, you, you have to approach it really thoughtfully because that will kill the industry. You're right. Um, so I'm really, I have no tolerance for things that make people ill. I just think there's no excuse for that now. That's One more question to that. Do you see a demographic of age or whatever demographic that you're looking for in terms of the audience? For sure. Well, I think the, co the content is made for gamers right now, right? There, there's a lot of shooter, you know, there's content. And I've talked to a lot of arcade owners who, you know, I said, listen, I want to bring content that will appeal to women as well as, you know, younger people where you can play as families. And they were like, yes, please. You have no idea how many moms come in with their kids. And they, they look around and they say, oh, it's all shooting? Come on, we're, we're leaving. Um, he said, but if I get, you know, if I can get people on a date or, p or families to come in and experience these things together and have fun, like if it's a collaborative thing where we're solving a puzzle together and, oh, look, I have to pull this lever while you push that thing down. Let's all do it at the same time. People that are, you know, things, experiences that are really engaging, that's when we're going to get everybody in this experience, you know. I will jump in on that and also say that at VRLA, what was it, a week, two weeks ago, so I teach a class for Girls Make VR. Uh, there are 12, 28 12 year olds um, and they all attend LAUSD's only all girls STEM school. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's called Girls Academic Leadership Academy. If you haven't heard about it, check it out. So we're teaching these young women right now. Uh, there are 28 of them. They're broken down into groups. Four of the groups are learning to code in unity and build their own experiences. And one group is a group of filmmakers, and those girls are my group. So we took them to VRLA, and they went wild. They put the headset on. It was as though they had been wearing a headset their entire life. They took to every experience. Uh, there was an experience about zombies. It was an AR experience, and they had like the hollow lens on. And one of uh, the young girls screamed after she saw the first zombie jump out and refused to go any further. But there was this moment where any hesitation that I had about the future of this industry vanished in that moment. Um, I realized that there are a lot of uphill battles that we are all working together to overcome. Um, and to your question earlier, I think the simple answer for me is time. I mean, if you look at how far the gaming industry has come and you look at where the game stood, I think there has been this pressure on our industry to get everything perfectly very rapidly. And we are experimenting and creating, um, but watching those 28, 12-year-old girls um, 
embrace every type of experience that was there just showed me what where the future lies and it's gonna be with those girls yeah I think the audience now is gamers because they're the ones that invest in those kind of Mm -hmm. headsets but once the headsets headsets become widely available uh, I think it'll have a real mass appeal yeah it's sort of like our social programming. The more that you grow up with it, the more that you're accepted as part of reality. And I think that a lot of people, especially, I don't know, maybe 50 plus or retirees, 65 plus, once you have that one bad experience, you're going to write it off forever. And that's like just goes with the way that we as humans humans that we deal with things when your body gives you that reaction and you don't like something you just you don't eat that or do that or drink that it's that sort of thing and so once that perception's there on an earlier model that was maybe five six years ago at the county fair they didn't experience and got really (laughs) nauseated never going to touch it again Mm -hmm. Um, but with the children I mean they're growing up with it every single day so they're desensitized to any sort of negative reaction are there, I think we have time for about two more questions. Are there any other questions in the audience? Yes. Um, in my experience with VR, it seemed like back in the day there was a lot of eye tracking issues where, you know, if you have a lazy eye or if you weren't a normal person, they'll show you normally physically, you had some uh, roadblocks, which a lot of them have fixed. Uh, one thing that I'm still seeing is the recurring issue of people not sure if they should be putting the headset on with their glasses or mm-hmm. without their glasses. I have that problem all the time because I go to all kinds of conferences to CVR and I'm, con- I'm like, oh, darn, I should have worn my contacts. How do I forget this every time? So I try to jam it on over, you know, over my glasses and then it always hurts and it's really awkward. Um, I do believe the new Oculus Go has, has an adjustment for your glasses. So you actually fit your glasses in and then put the headset on. So I think we'll see more and more of that accommodating that. But yeah, it's, a, it's a, one of the issues that's a problem for me too. Right. No, yeah, but you know, everyone's prescription is different, right? Like this eye is different than this eye, so how do they adjust for that? And yeah. 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 Any other questions? Was someone someone had a comment oh. over here? Oh yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Any other? I feel like I'm calling an auction or something. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. I love tree. Yeah. What's wrong with tree? <laughs> I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think there's going to be a lot more experiences uh, or experimentation with haptics. You know, what works, what doesn't. You know, if you do the void experience, there's lava under your feet that you can feel. And, different, and, and that was, you know, some of the people that saw it, that was their favorite part of the whole thing, right? So different things appear, appeal to different people. Um, so no, I definitely don't feel like we're out of the gimmick stage. I think there's just going to be a lot more. There's a lot of, of different rigs that are built where you can run. You know, you're, uh. you're like got the thing around your waist and you can run in VR. Didn't quite work for me. Some people love it. I think we're going to see a lot of that funky stuff that will be in museums, you know, 20 years from now. Well, that, that leads to the, the whole blue material side of the mm. Of course, that's going to happen, right? Yeah. yeah. Supposedly, that's where the people who are, are making money with the early adopters because that's what happens with every new technology, right? Yeah, I'm going to stick with the location based experience way of making money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is 3.30, which technically concludes our time. Um, Thank you all so much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you to our phenomenal panelists who are professionals who also happen to be women. We will be around for a little while if anyone wants to come up and ask any questions. Thank you.